In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Good afternoon, everybody. So I invite you please to be seated. So I welcome you all here to our church today for this funeral mass for Peggy Logan. I welcome Peggy's family, especially her sons, Leo, Keelan, Raymond and Dermot, daughters, Marie and Assumpta, her sister, Nula, her grandchildren, extended family and friends, and all of you who have gathered with us today to celebrate Peggy's funeral mass. I welcome also to Father Dermot here, who needs no introduction. Father Dermot, you're most welcome to be with us today. Also, I welcome Peggy's sister, Ellen, who is in the USA, and all who are viewing this Mass online via the webcam. As we know, Peggy was a very active lady throughout all her life. She lived a very full life with many interests. So now I invite some of her family to bring forward symbols of her life, and Leo will explain to us the significance of these symbols in the life of Peggy. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon at this stage. Uh, the symbols uh, represent my mother's later part of her life. Earlier part of her life, we would be bringing over something like a pint bottle of Guinness, but no, we're talking about the later part of her life. Orla is going to bring up her uh, mass book and her beads. She was very, uh, very, very strong <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, when it came to the, the rosary and her prayers. Very, very religious person. Um, Connor is bringing up Connor bringing up the golf club and Sarah is going to bring up a pack of cards quite a, an unusual uh, collection of symbols um, I will uh, elaborate on all further uh, during uh, our um, during my eulogy and she could use it on you too father so she could So now I invite you please to stand as we just begin our Mass. We have gathered here to bid farewell to someone who was much respected and loved in the community, who was granted the grace of a long and full life. And while Peggy had a wonderful, reached a wonderful age, nonetheless for our family, the day too marks an end of an era and a certain sadness attached to it. But we stand here in a spirit of gratitude for the many blessings that came to her family, indeed to all of us who have known Peggy in life. As we begin our Mass, we pause now for a moment to reflect on our own lives as we ask the Lord's mercy and forgiveness for ourselves and for Peggy. Lord Jesus, you raise the dead to new life in the spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you came on earth to be our Savior, Christ of mercy. Lord Jesus, you continue to plead for us at the right hand of the Father. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us into everlasting life. Let us pray. 
O God, whose nature is always to forgive and to show mercy, we humbly implore you for your friend and servant Peggy, whom you have called to journey to you, and since she hoped and believed in you, grant that she may be led to our true homeland to delight in its everlasting joys. We make this our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. So now we be once again seated for the liturgy of the word. And our two readers, if you might come, please. Karen and Una. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to root up what is planted, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. God has made everything suitable for its time. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to Timothy. As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. It was very early on the first day of the week and still dark when Mary of Magdala came to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been moved away from the tomb and came running to Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, she said, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter set out with the other disciples to go to the tomb. They ran together, but the other disciple, running faster than Peter, reached the tomb first. He bent down and saw the linen cloths lying on the ground, but did not go in. Simon Peter, who was following now, came up, went right into the tomb, saw the linen cloths on the ground, and also the cloth that had been over his head. This was not with the other linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, they also went in. They saw and they believed. Till this moment, they had failed to understand the teaching of Scripture, that he must rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. If you are of my vintage or older, you will remember that one of the great and extraordinary events of the 60s happened on the 20th of July, 1969, when Neil Armstrong became the first human being to set foot on the surface of the moon. And I'm sure many of you will remember his immortal words when he said, as he stepped on the moon, this is one step, one small step for a man, but one giant step for mankind. And this was a, an extraordinary event watched by millions of people around the world as they anticipated what was to happen. I suppose it's, it's extraordinary still that there are skeptics who say that this never happened, that it was manufactured, and so on. Now, if those words could be said about a man stepping on the moon, that it was one small step for a man, but one giant step for mankind, surely the event which happened on the first Easter Sunday morning, was more extraordinary. And yet for a very significant event that changed human life and our destiny as human beings, by all accounts, it wasn't very spectacular at all. And again, people doubted it, even though the Lord had said in advance that it would happen. And just to recall the gospel passage which Father Dermot read there, the sight that greeted Peter and John was not the risen Lord, nor even his crucified remains, as they had hoped to find, but rather an empty tomb. Mary Magdalene said, what have you done with him? to the stranger, the first person she met. Mary, who knew and grieved for the human Christ deeply, could not see beyond her grief and the grave that the risen Christ was there, present to her. The astonishing truth came later. Yes, Christ was the firstborn from the dead. He had broken the death barrier he had conquered death as he said he would. And as we read in the preface of today's Mass, life is changed when we die, not ended. Sometimes Christians are referred to as an Easter people. 
By that we mean that the events of the first Easter colour our perception of life and how we live our lives in the world of today. Easter, of course, is the season when we celebrate our redemption and rejoice with gratitude alongside the risen Christ who made his victory over death our victory as well. So for the Christian, life is just not simply a matter of birth, life, and death, but rather birth, life, death, and resurrection. So even though as we gather with a a certain sadness today, which is natural in losing someone who we love no matter what age they have been, I think the overwhelming emotion, though, is one of gratitude for Peggy's long life, a life well lived. And certainly, Peggy was an Easter person. She had this positivity in her life based on a wonderful deep faith and the closeness of experiencing the Lord in all aspects of that life. Peggy was 91 years of age just last month, on the 15th of March. Peggy was reared, Peggy Pryor, was reared in the townland of Thrumran, the eldest of five siblings, two of whom died recently, Maureen in the US and Bertie in Sydney, Australia. So that makes three of that family who have now died recently. We are very happy and pleased to have here today her sister Nula Bowen and her other sister Ellen in the USA. Peggy, along with her siblings, attended school here in Balnamore. And as was the custom at the time from the children from Drumran, the walk to school along the railway line, but obviously had to be off the line before the narrow gauge train left, Ban- left the Ballamore station at 9.30. Indeed, just as a young, last year young teenager, Peggy moved into the town here to help her aunt and Mrs. O'Brien to run the pub, her pub after Mrs. O'Brien's husband had died. But romance was soon to develop for Peggy she met a Tom Logan, who was a butcher here, working in his cousin's butcher shop in Main Street, which I understand now will be where the library is located. And I say romance developed soon, and Peggy and Tom married in 1954, which was the marrying year. Also in that year, they bought out the pub business from Mrs. O'Brien. So it became Logan's Pub. In 1956, first of their six children arrived. So we can imagine that Logan's was a very house indeed, busy house. Peggy ran a good home and a very busy, well-run pub, as well as looking after her young family. Peggy was a fairly direct person, and I'm sure she didn't suffer fools too gladly in the pub. Someone has said to me fairly recently, a publican, he says, your job and mine is very similar. Oh, I says, I, that's interesting. He says, we all, we, both of us have to listen to all kind of tales. But at least, they said, when they're talking to me, they're probably sober anyhow. All was going wonderfully well until 1985, when her husband, Tom, died suddenly. And this was a very heavy cross for her and her family to carry. But like so many women of her generation, Peggy was a strong, resourceful woman, 
and resilient. And she carried out the business as usual, as well as providing for her family and taking care of her home. She was a terrific businesswoman. She knew the ins and outs of how to create a good business. And yet, for someone who had never been given the opportunity for further education herself, she was very determined that her family were given every opportunity to be well educated, regardless of the cost. And being a very practical person, she felt that having a pub was providing too many distractions for her family and prevented them from doing their homework properly. So the one major option then was boarding school. And I'm afraid the guys had to take that option. She was a bit more lenient with the two ladies, mind you. And I say today, you all have done her proud and were most supportive to her, especially during these last few years, through your frequent visits home and also to Ballinamore Nursing Unit. Peggy was rarely without a family member or a carer to assist her or to keep her company. And it was always a pleasure to visit her on my first Friday calls. She always seemed so relaxed in our chair, and I loved her sense of humour. Peggy sold the pub. After rather she sold the pub, she got a new freedom, a new lease of life, and involved herself in the church, the community, social activities, where she developed many new friendships along the way, as was her nature. And it certainly gave her more time for her golf and for her cards. Incidentally, she was a member of the first group of Eucharistic ministers here in the church, a ministry she was still active in during my first few years here in the community. Peggy was able to stay at home as long as she could through, I say, the support of her family and carers. But obviously, her health was deteriorating and it was necessary for her to have full-time care. Unfortunately, she became a resident in Ballinamore Nursing Unit where she received, settled in well and received excellent care there. Peggy became unwell on Friday last and later in the night she was transferred to Calvin General Hospital for she left us suddenly and unexpectedly on Saturday morning. Having joked and smiled with one of the kitchen staff a short while earlier as she was awaiting her tea to come. So no matter what age a parent is when they die, there is always, I say, that sense of loss. And for her family, today is an end of an era. And when the last parent dies, the pull to come home diminishes or decreases. Today, as we celebrate Peggy Logan's life, our overwhelming sense is one of gratitude to God for the gift of this good lady. Her presence was always a source of strength and encouragement for others. She always struck me as someone who saw the glass half full, an independent person with determination to overcome whatever obstacles that came her way. And remember, she was a widow now for 39 years. So with the message of Easter so fresh in our minds, may our family find support and comfort in it. As we read later in the Eucharistic prayer, and as I remind you again, death is not 
the end, but a new beginning. Lord, for your faithful people, life is changed, not ended. So today, dear friends, we entrust Peggy to the mercy and love of God. Our final prayer is, may God take you, Peggy, to himself, unite you with your beloved Tom, and may the same Lord comfort your family and all who grieve for you this day. May you rest in peace. Now invite those who are to read the prayers of the faithful if you come forward, please. <clears throat> For those who live a sincere and good life, the hour of death is transformed into an hour of glory because Christ gives them the crown of eternal life. With confidence, then, let us pray to our God. As we grieve, we know that at this very time others are grieving great losses too. Teach us to be sensitive to the suffering and pain of others. Help us to take strength from the community of brothers and sisters in faith. Lord, hear us. Lord, bless you, hear us. Granny Peggy touched all our lives. May the ideals and beliefs that she put before us remain in our lives. Lord, hear us. Lord, bless you, hear us. Let us pray for those who care for the sick and dying, especially those who cared for Peggy. Lord, hear us. Lord, bless you, hear us. We pray for all our departed brothers and sisters. Today we pray for Tom, Frank, Loretto, Maureen, and Bertie. May Peggy be reunited with them in God's kingdom, where there is no more pain and suffering. Lord, hear us. For a quiet moment now, we remember our own particular intentions. Lord, hear us. Lord, as we remember Peggy today, we, we thank you for the gift of her, of being herself. We thank you, Lord, for us, above all, for ministry to the parish here and support of the parish, but also for her words of encouragement and kindness. Lord, hear us. As you mentioned already, she had a great devotion to the Rosary, to Our Lady. So now we ask Mary, our mother, to comfort her family, to comfort Peggy's family as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour for death. Amen. Lord, may you support us all the day long, to the shadows lent and the evening falls, and the busy world is hushed, and the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then in your mercy, Lord, grant us a safe lodging, a holy rest, and peace at last through Christ our Lord. So now we have the gifts of bread and wine will be brought forward to the altar and we come for us the body and blood of Jesus in the celebration of our Mass.
Pray, my sisters and brothers, that the sacrifice that we offer today may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your friend and servant, Peggy, we beseech your mercy that she who did not doubt your son to be a loving Saviour may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty God, and Almighty and Eternal God through Christ our Lord. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with all the angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we pray the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. I invite you please to kneel for Eucharistic prayer number three. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing. He broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving your thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O oh Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, 
we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Catherine and all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity our pilgrim church on earth, your servant Pope Francis, Martin, our bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people your son has made for his own. Listen to the prayers of the family you have gathered here before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember those whom you have called to yourself. We pray especially today for Peggy. With Peggy, we remember Tom. We remember Frank and Loretto. We remember Bertie and Maureen. And all the deceased members of the Pryor and Logan families and extended families. With them all, Lord, we hope one day to enjoy forever the vision of your glory through Christ our Lord, from whom all good things come. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. Amen. Guimish Hananar, Femar Duin, Arslani Hor, or Yenev. O Nyahar Atha Ernav, Ganefer Danum Gadagatarit, Ganenta the Heller and Talaf Mayenta Ernav, Honor on Lehu, Tor Duni New, August Maitu in a Vika, Marawahimich the Vecuna Fain, August Alixini Gahu, Axer Shin O Walk. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant us peace in our days. In your mercy, keep us free from sin. Protect us from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your Church. Graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. And we pause for a moment, just recall the words that Jesus said to the disciples in Sunday's Gospel, peace be with you. We welcome that peace into our own lives, and we pray for peace, especially in all troubled parts of our world at this time. mingling of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, bring eternal life to all of us who receive it. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. This is Jesus, the bread of life, who nourishes us on our earthly pilgrimage and leads us to take our place at the eternal banquet. Blessed are those that are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy. You shall enter under my roof, but only say the word, my soul shall be healed.
Just for the reception of Holy Communion, just remind you that you may come forward through the center aisle and return to your seats by the side aisles. Also, if you're not receiving communion, you're welcome to come forward to receive a blessing, but I just ask you please to use that symbol to indicate as a blessing you wish to receive. And finally, if you suffer from a celiac condition, you may receive a sacramental host here, gluten-free host here, by going to the minister who has this type of ciborium with a little cup attached to it.
Let us pray. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that Peggy, your friend and servant, for whom we have celebrated this Paschal Sacrament, may pass over to a dwelling place of light and peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Now invite Leo and Joe to wish to say a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to recite a little poem. It was coined by a gentleman called Phil McGoohan from Ahu, who passed away in 1917. Um, I've changed some of the wording at the end, and I've passed it with Father Sean here, who censored it accordingly. And uh, the poem was titled Bail and Ahamore, but for this occasion, I'm going to title it A Poem for Peggy. <clears throat> it is with affection these lines I mean to pen, in memory of my childhood days when I was scarcely ten. I always liked to ramble, to pluck the berry and the slow, along the daisies sloped canal where Leitrim waters flow. Above its rippling waters, here stands old Riversdale, its mansion house in splendor, its wood and its flowery vale. Its landscape clear each day appears as the golden sun sinks low and the beech trees move with the breeze where Leitrim waters flow. There stands the bridge of Ahu, a grim and stately pile where tourists seat and lovers meet and travelers rest a while. The honey tips the woodbine as the summer sun sinks low and the midnight twilight veils the arch where Leitrim waters flow. Upon each Sunday evening in the merry month of June, when all the feathered warbles are pouring forth their tune, upon each towering battlement the boys sit in a row, while beneath their feet like amber threads those Leitrim waters flow. The angler with his hook and line along those banks did roam, companions of my childhood days that was not far from home. And as my days draw to a close, those thoughts fly back to me of the lovely scenes around Drumran where Leitrim waters flow. And now those days have vanished Youthful pleasure, it is gone. 
My work now here is finished. It's time that I moved on. I'm with my Lord and Saviour. To him I had to go. From Ahu Bridge and my dear home drum ran, where Leitrim waters flow. Thanks, Joe. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, Joe and Assumpt have to rush away uh, because uh, their daughter, excuse me, <coughs> Maeve, isn't well at the moment. Now, gather yourself. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I know you've travelled far, and all that attended last night, there was huge numbers last night, and stood in the rain. Uh, from every corner of Ireland. I'd like to welcome those that are online, and in particular my daughter. I'm going to wave to her. She's over in Vietnam at the moment. Uh, we have relatives online from Australia. That would be Bertie's family. Uh, relatives from Spain. And we have uh, people from uh, New Jersey and California all online. Um, and I want to thank everybody who posted uh, condolences, some very, very lovely comments. be quite honest with you. I nearly didn't recognise my mother in some of them, too, you know. But, you know, uh, if she was here now, well, she is here now. If she was here now, and I was to make that comment, she'd be up beside me and she'd give me a clip across the ears. So she. But um, I'll start off by saying she didn't have it easy uh, coming into town as a young girl, and Father Sean alluded to it. Uh, and she worked just across the street here, so she did uh, with uh, an aunt or a relative of hers, uh, a Mrs. O'Brien. She was prior, her maiden name was prior. And she moved into the bar after the, 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 uh, um, the lady's husband, Alanzi O'Brien, passed away in 1948. So she's been in town here as a young girl. She was only 15 when she came into town. She's been in town here uh, all of that length of time. And she's been in the bar over there for 41 years. She sold out of the bar in 1989. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, it wasn't easy at the time because um, there were a lot of bars in the town in Baltimore. There was 25 or 26 of them, and trying to make a living out of it, it was very, very difficult. Uh, not similar challenges a lot of people in the town faced at the time, and that's why you had all the emigration. She did it anyway and she made a life for herself and her family through hard work and dedication. Uh, she was, anybody who knew her, uh, she was made of tough stuff, <laughs> and uh, she needed to be, uh, uh, to do what she did, and to be quite honest with you, to rear us, because uh, we were definitely a challenge, so we were, you know. Uh, she called it as she saw it, whether you liked it or not, and she wouldn't be long putting you in uh, your box, you know. Uh, she was a great believer in education, uh, having witnessed um, her siblings uh, emigrate, as was the norm then. And she was determined to give us every opportunity to a good education. Uh, even after my father died, she made sure that Ray and Dermot, the two youngest, that they continued their education in boarding school, away from the obvious distractions, as Father Sean said, of running a busy pub. Uh, they wouldn't get an opportunity to study or do anything and partic particularly a, a widowed woman uh, running a pub business. Uh, Peggy had a new lease of life after she got out of the pub business, and for the first time in her life, uh, she had some time for herself and an opportunity to do some things for herself. She developed many friendships through her various activities, friends like Theresa Hamill and Lily McGovern, <laughs> Winnie and Kitty, the scourges of the golf course, Sister Coleman, to name but a few. She took up golf and bridge and became involved in the church, which was a passion for, with her. Uh, time moved on, and over the last few years, she faced uh, some medical challenges uh, and some memory issues, short-term memory issues. Uh, she was always in good spirits and still cap cap very capable, uh, very, very capable of giving you a piece of her mind, you know. Uh, she was quietly reflective and would always inquire of her friends who had sadly passed away at the time, uh, which reflected the depth of the friendship that she had developed with those people. Uh, Father Sean, or Sean as he likes to be known, asked me about the symbols uh, of her life. 
and uh, we have a very different combination, so we have there. Uh, and they represent her later life after she got away from the pub business. Uh, and uh, what we have is a rosary beads in our prayer book. The rosary was very important to her. Uh, we have a, a golf club, and uh, we have a pack of playing cards, quite an eclectic mix there, so there is a collection there. She was a very religious person, and she was a great woman for the rosary. Uh, she loved bridge, whist, other card games, 25 and poker, although not a gambler, I want to stress that, and was a regular at all the various card drives in the area. She loved golf and the friendship she developed through the game of golf. So you're asking, where's the link in all of this? Well, the link is quite simple and quite straightforward. The beads are a pair that she got from <laughs> the, bishop, the bishop, Francie McKiernan, uh, on the day that he delivered the golf club. Uh, Peggy's friend, Winnie, uh, 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 from, uh, who was in New York at the time, sent the golf club as a birthday present, and the bishop had to bring it the whole way from New York. So I'm just asking you to, in your mind's eye, visualize the scene. A bishop of the church with a golf club under his arm getting off the flight from New York. But anyway, he arrived to the house with the golf club, realized it was her birthday, gave her the beads and the golf club, and stressed to her the importance that she contact her, his cousin, uh, Winnie McTague, and let her know that the club was delivered safe and sound. That was the power that Winnie wielded, so it was. The beads were always hanging uh, from a holy figurine in the car. And, uh, you know, whoever was the front seat passenger, it, it could have been uh, Theresa Hamill or Lily McGovern or, or, or Kay Dolan or James Dooner uh, on their various excursions to bridge or wherever they were going to golf or, or, or uh, a whist drive somewhere. They were in charge of the beads, so they were, you know, so the discussion would start, would start. And if they became aware that anybody in the locality was sick, uh, there was a, a decade of the rosary said for them. It, it probably started Ardrum Hill and from there to wherever they were going. Um, we used to, or I, uh, in fact, referred to the, the car at one stage as Knock Shrine on Wheels. She wasn't pleased at all. She, she, she nearly took the head of me. How dare you? But anyway, so uh, there were more people in the locality prayed for in that car. Everybody, everything. Sick, the elderly, good weather for the farmers, you name it. And there was a decade of the rosary said. Uh, the golf club was used very, very frequently. Peggy and her friend Winnie were renowned for their golfing exploits. Winnie would arrive from New York, Winnie McTague. She would arrive from New York probably in late spring. And from then on, the pair of them would haunt the golf course. You know, uh, they even went in their 80s, in their early 80s, went for a golf lesson down to the golf pro in the Sleeve Russell. Can you visualize that, the poor golf pro? Uh, I have, I have a story of my own. Uh, one day I was out playing golf with my mother, you know, and we, it was infrequent, to be quite honest with you. Uh, sadly, infrequent. But uh, this day she was complaining about her, her, her uh, golf shot, her tee shot, off the tee, and she wasn't getting any distance, you know. And I rather cheekily said to her, ah, the problem here, Mammy, is that you're, you're, you're anatomically challenged. And she looked at me, uh, what do you mean? What do you mean? I said, look at yourself and your, and your build and your, and your upper body, you know. And she looked down at her bosom, so she did. And, and I looked away, smirking and being smart, you know. And next thing is, I got this clout of a golf club across, <laughs> across the back. I'll never forget it, anyway. But anyway, uh, she, made, uh, she made wonderful friends. Uh, through the golf club, and we're very sorry that she's not around for their 90th celebration. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank uh, some people uh, uh, on behalf of the family. I think um, first and foremost is uh, Father Sean here, uh, and Moses, who's, who's with him as the parish clergy, and Father Dermot. Uh, Father Dermot and myself go back a long way. We, were, we started off in 
baby infants together, so we did way back, right straight through to the sixth class. Father Dermot was sent off to Pats and Cav, and I was sent to Mel's in Longford, you know, so uh, we parted ways there. But we've always been friends, you know. I tell one very, very funny story, and it was only when I saw Father Dermot walking out that I thought of it. It was vis-a-vis -vis my mother, and I used to come up and take her out for lunch, and we'd go up to Priors uh, invariably for a lunch some days, and one particular day Father Dermot was there, and he was entertaining some guests, you know. And I said to my mother, you know, Peggy, as we all knew her, I said to Peggy, do you know who that is? Uh, and Father Dharma came over and introduced himself. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I said, did you know who it was? Of course I knew it was Father Dharma. For God's sake, sure didn't I change his nappy when he was a baby? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't mind me saying that, Dharma. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Peggy, um, she always hoped that some of us would become a priest, you know, uh, or a nun. But the wise Mrs. Cavanagh, I don't know if you knew Cavanagh's shop down here, just down the road from us. My mother used to wander down there in the early afternoon to get some bits and pieces for the tea. But the wise Mrs. Cavanagh informed Peggy, my mother used to pontificate about, about uh, you know, some of us going on for the priesthood, you know, but Mrs. Cavanagh knew better, so she did. And the wise Mrs. Cavanagh informed Peggy that this was never, never going to happen. And Mrs. Cavanagh stood back, so she did from the counter, and she folded her arms, and she looked at Peggy, and she said, Peggy, to be quite honest with you, the only place up around Dublin that any of your boys is going to end up in is Mount Joy, and not Maynooth. <laughs> so that, that, burst, that burst my mother's bubble anyway. But she took it in good spirit and had a good laugh and walked away from it. Mrs. Cavanagh was a wise woman, so she was. Um, I want to thank Sean Burke and his staff for their constant presence, care, and attention. Uh, Brian and the McDevitt staff, who are being very, very good. And of course, the management and the staff of uh, the Ballymore Nursing Unit. My mother moved into it in November or in December. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, she wasn't settled initially, but she was great over the last three months. You know, we're just so sad that uh, it, it didn't last longer. They've been absolutely wonderful there. And uh, we would like to thank the staff of both Sligo and Cavan uh, hospitals. But I, I need to move on to some very, very special people. <sighs> Excuse me, because these people are very, very special. Uh, and I'm, I'm referring to uh, the cares, the home cares. They were absolutely brilliant. Mary Creamer and Geraldine Pryor who were her constant helpers. They were absolutely, and my mother loved them and they loved her. Uh, and it was a, a symbiotic re relationship nearly. Eileen Gallagher, who uh, cared, did the evening cover, and Kathleen McCrory, who did the weekend cover. Uh, and I want to thank, from the bottom of our hearts, um, the wonderful Noli McGoldrick and Rosalind Flynn, who was a relation of my mother's, who helped with us, helped us when things became more challenging in the house. So, uh, with that, farewell, Peggy. Until we meet again. Thank you all. Thank you to Leo and to Joe um, for your beautiful contributions. Very moving. By the way, we had a letter from the bishop last week and he's looking for deacons. <laughs> so if you can't become a priest, you can become a deacon. I think Joe would be in an ideal position now to, to take that responsibility on. Uh, thank you all for being here, um, as Lee referred to last night, the huge numbers last night, but th your presence is much appreciated. I always think it's important to recognize your presence at a 
removal of funeral mass or wherever in the funeral uh, home because your presence is recognition of you uh, empathizing with the family, being with them and supporting them and through our prayers to ask the Lord to comfort them. Thanks to Leo here for helping me prepare the liturgy and for all who took part in, our, in the Mass today. And also a very special word of thanks to our two on the gallery, to Carolyn and Bridge. Thank you so much for your beautiful contribution. And to Patricia here for Eucharistic ministry and Father Dermot and also to our Sarkerston Monica. So now we will have the a prayer of final commendation and farewell. And then after that, then we'll have an opportunity for you to offer your sympathy to the family. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our friend, our sister Peggy. May our farewell express our affection for her. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet her again with the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. And for a quiet moment, we remember and we pray for, pray for the happy repose of Peggy's soul. We will bless her coffin with holy water to remind us of her baptism. And Father Dermot will incense the coffin to remind us of the dignity that she and all of us enjoy as temples of God's Holy Spirit. And also it anticipates our own resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> The response is, receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. Saints of God, come to her aid, hasten to meet her angel of the Lord. Receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. May Christ, you call you, take you to himself. May angels lead her to the bosom of Abraham. Receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. Eternal rest grant to her, O Lord, that perpetual light shine upon her. Receive her soul and present her to God the Most High. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our sister and friend, Peggy, in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died with Christ, she will rise at him on the last day. We give you thanks for all the blessings which you bestowed upon her in this life. they are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ Jesus. Merciful Lord, turn towards us, listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your friend. Help us to remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with Peggy forever. Amen. So now we have an opportunity. If you haven't already sympathized with the family, you may do so now. So please come forward through the center aisle, please, and you may exit this door here.
you, did you go around the panel? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I introduced myself to them. Let us pray. To your Lord we commend the soul of Peggy, your friend and servant. In the sight of this world she is now dead. In your sight may she live forever. Forgive whatever sin she committed through human weakness, and in your goodness grant her everlasting peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. In peace now let us take our sister to her place of rest in Uktara Cemetery. Thank mm -hmm. you. 